introducing our last new speaker for the summer school. Yeah. Um, <laughs> my sadness is greatly mitigated, however, by the fact that the person I have to introduce is John Hughes, a uh, longtime mainstay of the functional program community, a uh, uh, big contributor to, in particular, Haskell, uh, and expert on monads and all that. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> so let me start off by saying that I took the description of this course seriously, um, that uh, I should plan on speaking to people who've taken a, an undergraduate programming languages course. I assume you know what functional programming is, but I, I should not assume that you are familiar with Haskell. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to introduce the idea of a monad and um, explain why they're important to Haskell programmers. So if you already eat monads for breakfast, then I'm sorry that we're going to be doing the uh, very easy stuff for you. But I hope that there are enough of you who are familiar with other languages that you'll find this stuff um, valuable. Okay, so let's start off. For those of you who have never used Haskell, here is an example of a data type definition. Um, this is defined in the type of binary trees. And a tree containing leaves of type A is either a leaf or it's a branch. And if it's a leaf, it contains a component that is an A. If it's a branch, it has a left and a right subtree, which are also trees. So I know you've been working hard on COC this week, um, which you know much, much better than me nowadays. Nevertheless, I believe that this is the corresponding type definition in COC. So we're defining a tree of A's with two constructors, leaf and branch, and they have the same types in Haskell as they do in COC. So this should be all very nice and familiar, I hope. Here's an example of a tree. Uh, if I declare little t to be a, a branch whose left subtree is a leaf labeled with A, and right subtree is another branch with labels B, B and C, then that represents this little structure that you can see on the right of the slide. Okay, so I'll use that example for the next slide or two. Um, we can write functions in Haskell just by pattern matching on the data types. So here is a function that maps f, a function f, over all the data in a tree. So to map f over a leaf, well, we just construct a new tree, which is a leaf labeled with f of a. And to map over a branch, then we construct a new tree with a branch which is the branch whose left subtree is obtained by mapping over the left subtree of the original and the right subtree correspondingly by mapping over the right subtree. So there we are. All very easy. And if I tree map a two uppers function that converts strings to uppercase over the example tree that I had on the previous slide, then I'll get this one, which is, has just the same structure, but all the strings have been changed to uppercase. What's the type of tree map? Well, it has a polymorphic type. So for any types A and B, if you give it a function from A to B and a tree labeled with A's, it'll give you a tree labeled with B's. You've all been studying category theory this week, so you know what that means, don't you? It means tree is a functor. And one of the nice things about Haskell is that we can say that um, explicitly. Here's how we do that. This is an example of a Haskell class. It's the way that Haskell deals with overloading. And it defines a class called functor. What it says is that a type f is a functor if you can implement this operation. And you can see that the type f actually must be a parameterized type for it to make sense to call it a functor. And there has to be... Um, an operation of the functor on functions. You have to be able to f map a or b and get a function from f a to f b. So now I said already that a tree is a functor. To declare that in Haskell, I would write an instance declaration for this class. So this specifies that for a particular f, namely the tree type that we've just seen, I can implement f map in the way that you see here. And um, the definition of fmap is just the same as the definition of tree map on the previous slide. So we're going to be seeing a lot of class and instance 
declarations of these lectures. So I want to make sure that we understand how these things work. So now, once I've done that, then I can use fmap to apply my two uppers function, map it over a tree. And fmap can now represent um, the action of any functor, but because the argument t is actually a tree, then the type checker will figure out that it's this particular implementation of fmap that should be used. Okay. I hope that's all well and good. If there's anything unclear about this so far, now is a good time just to ask a question. All very easy. Good. Okay, so let me go on and write a few more functions. I'll just play with trees a little bit. Um, one of the things I might want to do is to label the leaves with their index in depth first order. So here you can see I want to construct a tree with the same structure but where the leaves are being replaced by those indices. And that's very easy to do. Um, I'll call the function number. So to number a leaf, all I need to do is construct a leaf and increment a counter to get the next um, index. And to number a branch, all I need to do is recursively number the left and right subtrees and then combine them with a the branch constructor. All nice and easy, but wait a minute. What's that? <laughs> Haskell is a purely functional language. I can't increment a counter somewhere and have a different result each time I call tick. It's, it's not part of the programming language. So maybe that seems a little awkward, but a, there's a, a standard way of dealing with the problem. Uh, since I can't update the counter uh, via a side effect, I'll have to instead pass in the counter value as an argument and return the new counter as part of the result. Here's how I can do that. The counter is now um, represented by all those red S's. So it's the state that's being modified as I perform this traversal. So I've added an extra parameter to my function, passing the state in. And now when I number a leaf, I need to increment the counter. So I use the value I've got and I return the incremented value. How do I number the left subtree? Well, I have to pass in the state that I start with, and that'll return a labeled subtree and a new value of the counter, which I must pass in to the right labeling. And I must take then the result that comes back from the right labeling and return that as part of the result of the entire labeling. OK, so I can do it. Blah. This is horrible code. All I wanted to do was increment a counter in one place. And yet, to do that, so I had to thread the value of the counter through all of my code. That's not modular at all. And I can tell you something else. It's also very error prone. You see all those primes? I can tell you from painful experience, it's very easy to forget one of them. And if you do, your code simply doesn't work. You end up starting with the same value of the counter for the left and right subtree, for example. Or you return the wrong value. Oh, it's ghastly. Finding those bugs is nightmarish. So, hmm, okay. Well, this example was a bit awkward, but uh, let me do another one. Here's another nice operation on trees. I might zip two trees together. So, what I want to do is to take two trees of the same shape and... Uh, they may have labels of different types, and I just want to pair up the labels at the leaves in a corresponding way. So, for example, if I take the numbered trees that I just showed you how to construct, and I zip tree that with a tree, then I'll get a tree in which the labels are paired with their positions. And that might be a good first step in an algorithm that would then perhaps map something over a tree and process each label in a way that depends on... Uh, uh, on the position that it's at. Yes? Well, it doesn't really make sense to zip them. <coughs> How to pair the, the nodes that the topology is different? How to zip them? Yeah. We might be coming to that. <laughs> so let, let me ignore that. <coughs> the code for zipping trees of the same shape. 
Um, so if I zip two leaves, then I just construct a leaf and pair the, the labels. If I'm zipping two branches, then I zip the two left subtrees and I zip the two right subtrees and then I combine them with a the branch constructor. All very nice and simple. But what if I call zip tree on two trees that do not have the same shape? So here, this is in the Haskell read eval print loop, uh, is what happens if I try to zip a leaf in a branch. And what I get is a crash at an error message at the terminal. And that's not really very nice. I might like to um, handle that failure in my program rather than have a crash that uh, um, stops my, my program executing. Well, what, that's easy to solve, of course. All I have to do is add another clause now that matches any other case, if a leaf and a branch, or a branch and a leaf, and throws a, a, an exception, let's say trees of different shape. And then when I call zip tree, I can catch that exception so that if it happens that I'm able to take some appropriate action. But wait a minute, what are these catch and throw things? Haskell is a purely functional language. It doesn't have exceptions. <laughs> it's not quite true. It has some exceptions, but they're not useful for this. So I can't do it this way. Luckily, there's a standard technique for coping with this, and it is to change the result type of zip tree so that instead of crashing, given bad arguments, zip tree will just return a result that indicates that it had bad arguments. And the type that we usually use for that is this standard type called maybe. So a maybe A value is either nothing, representing a failure, or it's an A tagged with a constructor just. So if I give zip tree a new return type, maybe the tree of pairs, then when I call it, I'll be able to tell. If it returns nothing, I know that it failed. If it returns just, then I've got my answer. Okay, so let's, let's just modify the code. Here's how I zip two leaves together now. Just as before, except that I need to tag the result as just to indicate that I have succeeded. Here's the last case in which I fail. It's very easy to fail. I just return nothing. But there's a worrying amount of space, isn't there? <laughs> between the first and the third clause. And this is what you have to do in between. Okay, so if I'm zipping uh, two branches, then first of all, I have to zip the left subtrees, and then I have to inspect the result, and if it's nothing, if that call failed, then the whole function must return nothing. Otherwise, if it succeeded, then I can take, I've got my left zipped tree at least. Now I have to do the same to the right subtrees and check the result. And if the right zip fails, then the whole function must fail. If it succeeds, then I've now got my right subtree, and at last, I can construct the correct result and tag it with just. So I can do it, but bah. This is equally horrible. So once again, because I wanted to raise an exception in one place, I've had to thread the exception propagation or the failure propagation throughout my code. It's not modular at all. So this is enough to give a functional programmer effect envy. You know, we like functional programming because it lets us write short, concise, modular programs, but do we need to use effect sometimes to write modular code? That would be horrible. <laughs> but it looks kind of as though we do, doesn't it? Oh, well, now, just a minute. Functional programming languages are very good at abstraction. So let's see if we can deploy some abstraction to make all of this a bit less painful. First of all, let's examine that zip tree code that we just shuddered at. If we look at it, you can see that there's two places where I'm basically just returning a value, and I add this just tag. And it's very similar in the two places. There's also two places where I make a recursive call and then use the result. 
And if you compare the code fragments in those two red boxes, once again, they look very similar. So there's a pattern here. Um, there's one thing I do when I'm returning a value, and there's something else I do when I'm using a value. Let's see if we can abstract over that. Okay, so on the left here now, I've got what I did to return a leaf. Of course, I, I'm interested in how I return any value. So let's suppose I want to return x. All I have to do is tag it with just. So let me define a function, and since it's for returning a value, I'll call it return, that just, um, just tags the value with just. And what's the type of that? Well, it takes any a and turns it into a maybe a. On the right, I've got a code fragment that comes from the part of the function where I made a recursive call and then used the result. So I, I inspected it to see if it was nothing or just. If it was nothing, I propagated the failure by returning nothing again. So, of course, when I abstract this, I want to abstract something that's not just useful in zip tree. I should be able to inspect any maybe type and then do something appropriate. And if x represents a failure, then I'll return a failure. What if x represents a success, though? Well, in that case, the dot, dot, dots up here are probably going to use that value, L double prime. So how can I abstract over that? Well, let me abstract by saying that that dot, 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 I'll express it in the form F of L double prime. So now by choosing F appropriately, I'm going to be able to put code there that makes use of uh, that value. OK, so this is my general piece of code. And now let me just define a, a function that does that, given x and f. There it is. And this funny operator, greater than, greater than, equal, it's the standard name in Haskell. It's usually called bind. Um, you can also think of it as use x in f. I think that might be a more helpful way to think about it if you've not seen this before. And there's its type. Um, you give it an x, which is the maybe a you want to use. You give it a function that can use the value of a to, and then it's got to return another maybe type, but it could be a different type, maybe b. And then the final result is the same type as the result of f, and maybe b. OK, so after making those definitions, can I clean up my code? Well, in the two places where I just tagged a result with just, I can use return. And now if we look at the places where I made recursive calls, I can strip out all that case analysis and just replace it by a use of the bind operator. And now the second argument of bind is supposed to be a function. So it's a lambda expression. That's Haskell's lambda, that backslash. And this lambda expression has as its body all the rest of the clause. OK, so that's refactored the first call. I can do the same to the second. There we are. It's already looking better. And now let me just reformat the code. So all I'm doing here is reformatting. I'm not changing it at all. There it is. That's what it looks like as a result of the refactoring. So this is laid out in a way that may be unfamiliar if you've not been using monads. You can see that the lambda expression, lambda L prime prime, has its lambda on the right-hand end of the first line and its body on the left-hand end of the second and third, and so on. But um, you know, nevertheless, there's no reason not to write it this way. And you can now see that you can almost read the code as zip the left subtrees, call the result L double prime, zip the right subtrees, call the result R double prime, and then return a branch. Uh, containing those two. Well, that's a, quite a good improvement, I think. Let's go back to the node numbering. Can we do anything with this? Well, once again, there are two places where I'm returning a value, and in each case, I have to pair them with a state. And there are two places where I make recursive calls and use the result of those calls. And in each case, I have to pass the state beforehand in is an ad additional argument, and then I have to bind a pair, or match the result against a pair, to get the 
value delivered and the state to pass into the next operation. So let's do the same process. I can define how to return a value just by returning it paired with the current state. And now return has become a function of two parameters. But just to make it look more like the function that we saw previously, I'm going to um, move the S parameter over to the right-hand side using a lambda expression. Okay, so return X will now return a function from the counter value to the result and new counter. And I'm going to do the same thing to define bind. Okay, so this, this captures what's going on in the situations where I use a value. I, take the, I return a function that takes the counter in, passes it to X, getting a pair containing a new counter, takes the value obtained, passes that to F so it can be used, and then also passes F the value of the counter after we called X, and then returns the result of F there. And now if I go back to my node numbering function, then I can rewrite it. First of all, I take the branch case and rewrite it in a similar way to the other function. And once again, you see that I can convert my lets into two uses of bind. Number the left subtree, call the result L prime. Number the right subtree, call the result R prime, and then return the branch. Um, but the leaf case is a little bit trickier. And it's trickier because in the leaf case, I'm actually modifying the state. And neither return nor bind does that. So I'm going to have to um, define something else. So I'll define that case this way. I'm going to introduce a new operation, tick, that performs the state modification, and then use bind to combine that with the function that takes the current value of the state and returns it, it tagged as a leaf. What does tick do? Well, it returns a pair of the previous value of the state and the incremented state to be used later on. So, if you look at this code now, apart from in the tick function, which is doing something essentially to do with the state, I mean, that's where I wanted to increment the counter. Apart from that, none of the rest of the code mentions the state at all. And Certainly, I've had to rewrite my code, but I've done so in a way that does not make explicit all the state passing that's going on. So I feel that this is now a lot more modular than the code on the top half of the slide. OK, so what are the types of these things? Well, here are the return and bind that I used in the numbering code. And return takes an A and a state and returns a pair of them. Bind has this type, actually. It's a bit of a mouthful, I know. But the first argument, X, that's a function from a state to a pair of an A and a state. The second argument, F, takes the A from X, first of all, then it takes a state and then it returns another pair. And then the result of that is a function that takes a state and returns the BS pair. We can make it a bit more readable if I just introduce a type synonym. So instead of saying S arrow pair of A and S everywhere, let me just write state S A. This is how we define type synonyms in Haskell. Um, the type state S A is now exactly the same as the right-hand side. So I can just rewrite these types above. Return will be a function from A to state S A. Bind will take a state S A and a function from A to state SB and return a state SB. Just compare those to the types of the previous versions of return and bind. If you look at them, you'll see that everywhere that the bottom says maybe, the thing above says state S. So the types have exactly the same shape. And that suggests that there's some general thing here that we can abstract to a common pattern. That common pattern is a monad. So I already showed you how we could explain the concept of a functor in Haskell. In the same way, we can say what a monad is. A parameterized type M is a monad if you can define return and bind 
with the types that we've just seen. And we can define two instances of the monad class for the maybe type and the state S type. And if you substitute maybe for little m and the types up here, you'll get exactly the types that we had before. If you substitute state S, you'll get exactly the types that we had for the state passing return and bind. So just a little nice thing here. I define state as a type with two parameters, and here I'm using it with one. What does that tell us? Well, it tells us that types in Haskell are curried. And so if I want to construct uh, a type with one, with one parameter, I can do so by applying a type with two parameters to one of them. So that's kind of sweet. OK. Um, and admission, at this point, I'm pulling the wool over your eyes a little bit. But not very much, and we will remove the wool shortly. OK, so the way that we think about these things is we think of an MA as some kind of computation delivering a value of type A. So a maybe A is a computation that might fail. Uh, a state SA is a computation that needs a state and may change it. But they both deliver a result of type A. Return lets us convert a value into a computation, and bind lets us sequence two computations. So that's the intuition uh, that we use to think about these operations. OK, so this is a common pattern extracted from two examples. If there were no more examples, then it would not be very interesting. So let's see. What else can we do? Here's an example close to my heart. Random generation. So because Haskell is a purely functional language, we can't define a random generator that returns a different result every time we call it. Rather, we must pass a random seed around and use that uh, when we want to generate something. So Haskell provides um, a, a library for random number generation, and it contains this next function that takes a seed, that's what stud gen is, and it returns a random 30-bit integer and the updated seed, which we can then pass on to use for generation later. But Haskell's library also provides this rather nice function. Split takes a seed and splits it into two seeds, from which we can generate independent sequences of random numbers. And this is very nice for um, generating random data recursively. For example, if you want to generate a random tree, then you can take your seed, split it in two, and generate the left subtree with one seed and the right subtree with another. And that means that those two generations can then proceed independently of each other. Um, it's very nice in a lazy language like Haskell um, because it means that we can generate, for example, infinite trees. Um, if we had used the next, if we used the next function instead to thread the seed sequentially through a tree that we're generating, then we would end up um, not able to generate the right subtree until we'd finished generating the left one because we wouldn't have the right seed. And uh, that would mean that infinite data could not be generated. Okay, so these are the functions that Haskell provides. Here is a function that can generate a random integer in the range zero up to a bound. So it must take a seed as a parameter and then we'll call next getting a random number n and a new seed and then I'll just return n mod the bound. So that'll be a random number in the correct range. Now the nice thing here is that there's no need for me to return seed prime. I could just throw it away. As long as I make sure that every time I call random int, I give it a different seed. So I'm get, going to get my new seeds using split. Here's a function for generating random pairs. So it's a higher order function. Let's give it a generator for the first component and a generator for the second component. So it'll take a seed, split the seed in two, and then generate the first component with the first seed, the second component with the second seed. Very nice and simple. So here's an example. If I call it on a particular seed S1, then I might get the pair 2, 1, because each component is now generated as a random number in the range 0 up to 2. 
OK. Well, that's generators for integers and pairs. What about lists? Here's a random list generator. It's, again, higher order. It takes a random generator for elements. That's what random L is. And a seed. And let's see. First, I have to decide whether to generate an empty list or a cons. So I need to make a choice. And I'm going to do that by generating nil 20% of the time. So that's why I need to call random int in the range 0 up to 4. So to, if I get a 0, I'll just return the empty list. Otherwise, I'll generate a cons. So the first thing I have to do is to split the seed, of course, so that I've got one seed to generate that choice with and another seed to generate the rest of the list. How do I generate a cons? Well, I've got one seed, but I need to generate a head and a tail. This colon is Haskell's cons operator. So I better split C2 to get C3 and C4. Then I can pass C3 to generate the element and C4 to continue generating the list. Isn't it beautiful? Ah. So this is also horrible. It would be very, very easy to pass the wrong seed somewhere. Um, it would be easy to use a seed twice. And if you do that, then you'll get the same randomly, randomly generated data in two places. So this is really not very nice at all. But we can make the code nice, once again, by defining a monad. So let me define a monad random A that is just a function from a seed to an A. OK, can I define return and bind? Well, sure. Here's how. How do I return a value, the same value all the time? That's not random at all, of course. Well, I just take the seed and ignore it and return A. How do I sequence two random generators? Well, OK, I've got to do two generations, so I better take my seed and split it and then pass seed one to the first the first computation x, that'll give me a random result a that I can pass to f so I can use it in the second argument. And then I can pass the second seed, seed 2, to, um, to generate new stuff there. So that's great. And also, I, rather than writing functions like tick uh, explicitly, I'd like to define an operation for making random generation accessible. You can think of random maybe as an abstract type here. So how do I actually generate something? Well, I take my seed, I call next, and then, as we saw earlier, I just throw the new seed that it returns away. So we can think of generate as a random computation that gives me 30 random bits. OK. So this lets me capture the nasty part of those functions in a monad but I'm still pulling the wool over your eyes. What is the wool? The wool is that that definition up there defines a type synonym. The type random A is actually the same type as that function type on the right. And Haskell does not allow me to write class instances for type synonyms. Why? Because the type checker can't tell the difference between random and that function type on the right. So, you know, there could be conflicting instances, um, which conflict because of synonyms. So what I have to do instead is create a new type. This is the way that Haskell does that. It's very similar in meaning to the type synonym that we saw, but now random A is a new type, different from all previous ones, and it's isomorphic to the type that we had before. OK, well, if random A and stud gen arrow A are isomorphic, then we'd like to have functions for converting between the two. Where's the isomorphism? There it is. OK, so when we declare a new type, we also declare a constructor, which maps from the concrete type to the new abstract type. And usually, although it's optional, a destructor that maps back the other way again. So when I do that, now I can write this instance declaration, but
but I have to insert the constructors and destructors in the right places. That's where they go in the monad declaration. That's where you put them in the generation. So I've grayed them out a little bit because I think they, um, it's not terribly helpful to think hard about where these things go. Um, you just move them around until the type checker is happy. <laughs> now the wall is gone, you'll be glad to know. Okay, so if I come back now to my random list generator that was so horrible before, what does it look like now? Well, instead of starting off by splitting the seed, I can just, just start off by generating my random number in the range 0 to, to 4. So let's generate that, call it n. If it's 0, I'll return the empty list. And if it's anything else, then I'll generate an element, call it x, generate the rest of the list recursively, call it x's, and then return x cons x's. That's nice. So, I said that this monad is close to my own heart. Why is that? Because it's essentially the same as the generation monad that is used in QuickCheck, the testing tool that I've been doing, spending most of my time on recently. So, the monad in QuickCheck works in exactly the same way. It just it handles it a little bit more, that's all. Okay. Here's another example. Wouldn't it be great if functional programs could change the world? We've been dreaming about that for a long time. <laughs> so, for example, when we want to print a string on the terminal window, we could just call the put string function, give it the string we want to print, give it the current state of the entire universe, and let it return a new universe in which the string has been printed on the screen. Isn't that great? 